conversations are doing the rounds about whether or not music theory, musicology might not be inherently racist. Recently here on YouTube, Adam Neely released a video with the title Music Theory is Racist. It got over half a million views within a very short period of time. He later changed the title to Music Theory and White Supremacy. I am going to engage with it in this video indirectly. So this video is for anyone who is critically interested in this racism accusation made at professional musicology. But it's also a video for anybody interested in the place of great art in our culture and in the question, which we will touch in this video, of whether we can judge cultures at all, whether we can say that in a certain dimension, one culture is better than another. Let's go. Let's do some musicology together. Let's look at a couple of stretches of Beethoven's music and see if in the process we get unbelievably racist. I happen to have in front of me the theme of the Arietta from Beethoven's Opus 111. Now, when you do musicology, you're always going to end up with a two-bucketed conversation that eventually converges. The first bucket is all the layers of musical process. Now, musical process occurs on different levels. And it's important to capture everything that's going on in a piece, in a stretch of bars. So you might talk about the rhythmic progression of the uh, musical process in a piece. You might talk about the harmonic progression through the different levels of musical process. That's the number one bucket. Number two bucket is psychology. What's the expressive effect here? What is the psychological situation? If you're an actor playing this, and of course musicians who really perform well often think of themselves as actors. If you're an actor playing this, what, what would be the character you would be trying to enter into? Now, at the level of musical process, what we've got in these bars is astonishingly, breathtakingly, stratospherically simple. Great music is not meant to be made out of materials this simple. But Beethoven says, give me something simple and I will gaze upon it. And nothing will happen. And when nothing happens, everybody else goes away. But I know that if I keep my gaze and keep it more and keep it more and keep it more, I can grow something extraordinary out of the simplest objects in the world. Toward the end of the theme, Beethoven comes out of four bars in the relative minor and gives us a repetition of a very simple chord, the dominant. And it works, in fact, to convey the psychology of the piece, which I'll get to in a second. But it does that by using the simplest possible musical material. This is one of the most basic chords in all music. And Beethoven gives it to us five times and then another five times on the repeat. So it's about using the simplest means. Um, and this is very interesting because other composers would probably run away from means of such simplicity. They would want to back out of this situation of being stuck with such simple means. But Beethoven goes forward into it. And it's always a fascinating question when you combine genius with an application of willpower, when you combine genius with a certain kind of insistence, what the results are. In a different but similar way, Chopin did this with his expression. Because when he approached sentimentality, unlike other composers, the great composers who would run away from it, Chopin went further into it, stayed with it, insisted upon it, until it was transformed with a kind of sickly, unhealthy, feverish morbidity and given back to us in, in a way that, you know, we couldn't possibly 
call sentimental itch at all. So, um, very, very simple musical materials here. Um, what's the expressive effect? The expressive effect here is about elevation. It's about moving from here up there. It's not about already being there. It's about the endeavor of this process of elevation. It's something being done. Now, that doesn't mean it's being done by a single consciousness. It actually isn't. So this isn't like a Schubertian situation where you could conceivably think um, as you can in most of Schubert's sonatas and the impromptus. You can conceivably think of a single consciousness exploring a terrain, exploring levels, exploring spaces. Here, you don't necessarily think of a single consciousness. But there's a sense of elevation. This is religious music too. There's a sense of ecstasy and gratitude and ecstatic gratitude. And there is a sense of a kind of simplicity through complexity, distillation of experience. We could go on and do a five hour lecture, but what we have just done is said something a little bit about the structure of what's before us. And then we've said something about the character, the psychology. Um, to say about what we have just done, and I can tell you that what we've just done is very similar to what a good musicologist would do. To say that what we've just done is on any level racist, is, to use a technical term, silly. There are two questions we need to ask about whether there's something seriously wrong with the fact that we are studying all of these artistic masterpieces by white men. The first thing that could be wrong with it is if there are a lot of great works from the period of Mozart or Beethoven, who, which are not written by white men, and we just ignored them. And they're as good, but we've ignored them because we either don't know that they existed or because we are aware of them, but we have allowed what Mozart did and what Beethoven did to simply define what great music is. And we've done that in an arbitrary way. Now, is any of this plausible? No, not at all. The more important point is that Philip Yule and Adam Neely are simply not anti-racist enough and they're not feminist enough in their arguments. Because if I am, for example, a non-male, if I am a female born in 1800 with Beethoven's talent, the odds are I don't make it. So it isn't that there are all of these amazing works written by women in that period, and we've ignored them. It's rather that the talent that women were born with, they were not allowed to develop. So now let's look at the second possibility. The second question is, okay, if we haven't ignored all of these great works from the past, why are we as classical musicologists ignoring other traditions from other parts of the world and also ignoring important traditions in our own cultures. Why are we talking about Handel and Haydn but we're not talking about the blues? This is a complex question but let's start with an important distinction. The distinction between art and something that's really valuable and important that isn't art. So let's take an obvious example. Britney Spears's songs over the last couple of decades have not been art. They have been commercial products. And if you like them, you're either manipulated by them or you appreciate them for the commercial products that they are, the way you might appreciate, you know, the Apple phone I'm shooting this on or um, some kind of fast food product. But now let's get to the crux of the distinction. Why is this? Why is Britney entertainment and Beethoven art? Britney's entertainment because her music has no expressive value. 
it's got symbolic value. It doesn't express um, melancholy or joy. It gives you a box with the label melancholy joy, and then you can shove into that whatever is going on in your head. In other words, it's not at all transportational. It rather acts as a background tape to whatever it is that uh, you've already got going in your head. Let's take a much more complex example, Nina Simone. Now, as a musician, Nina Simone was more talented than most famous classical musicians. Um, she had supreme rhythmical strength. She had an extraordinary capacity for characterization. And it's possible that if she became a classical pianist, she'd certainly be better than many people who play at Carnegie Hall. For me, roughly what Nina offered was still entertainment, moving entertainment, extraordinary entertainment, entertainment with a big aesthetic dimension, with a big dimension of expressive content. But for me, it's still not art. Now, because I am professionally a philosopher, we need to raise an important philosophical issue here. Can you compare cultures? Can you say that one culture is better than another? I think roughly no. And the reason I say roughly no is because if a culture has sustained life for a very long time, the odds are it's got something to teach all of us. And also, of course, that it's managed to create certain distinctive conditions for human life and human flourishing. But you can compare cultures in certain respects. You can say that Sicily has a more extraordinary gastronomic tradition than, say, Tonga. Now, I've lived in Tonga for a while, so I know about the food there. Just like you might say that Germany has a more extraordinary musical tradition than does Tonga. Tonga might contribute something at the level of the organization of family life, etc. So what we're going to end up with is a conversation where some cultures are shit in certain respects and amazing in certain respects, and other cultures are amazing and shit in yet different respects. And so we're, we're going to end up with a series of better and worse in certain respects judgments. Now, there's a great tendency in our culture to think that we've got to say that everything is equal, that Tongan music is equal to German music, that Tongan food is equal to Sicilian food. Nobody can really believe that, because the only way you can think that if you, is if you think that evaluation is impossible. But if you think that evaluation is impossible, you have to think that positive evaluation of another culture is impossible. And if you think that, you have to give up on every single social justice and anti-racist project on earth because you're not going to be able to get anything off the ground because somebody can always just turn around and say, well, that's a different culture. You can't say anything about it. So in fact, when people walk around complacently in a self-congratulatory way, saying, oh, all cultures are equal in all respects, in fact, these people are completely dependent on the assumption that you can make positive judgments about other cultures. Because if you couldn't do that, then there'd be no way at all to critique prejudice and discrimination and bullshit being thought, being directed at these cultures by people who um, are prejudiced and may be in a position of power. So, because I want this video to end soon, let's land this plane. As art, Western art music, what we call classical music, is best. Is it best as music? Well, that's a question that doesn't make sense to me. I think there are other traditions that are extraordinary. But could I straightforwardly call the different blues traditions art? No, not straightforwardly, even though they have enormous depth and uh, an enormous aesthetic dimension. But as art, as far as art music goes, I am going to say that the big names that um, 
you know, resonate in our head are actually the people who came up with the greatest works. And is it a problem that they're white and male? Yes, it is a problem. And is it painful how slow within Western classical music this is changing? Yes, it is very painful to me. And I always celebrate when we have diversity, um, racial diversity and gender diversity. Um, you know, and uh, we're making very, very bad progress, but it's some kind of it's some kind of progress. And interestingly enough, at least on a feminist perspective, we're now living through an age of the um, female string player. I mean, this is how this age that we're in will stand out. Um, some other aspects of classical performance are not in the greatest shape at the moment, but the number of very good female string players is extraordinarily high, so high that it's painful because people can't make careers properly. And of course, we've got at least one historically great um, violinist on the platform, and that's um, Lisa Batyashvili. So let's land this plane for now. Um, of course, this has just been the beginning of a conversation. I thank you for your attention. Comment below and uh, um, I hope you're going to you know, jump on the train here because we're going to be um, doing a lot of classical music content soon. Take care.